Thank you for coming to the ICO financing conference. So we're excited uh, to see so many uh, developers, entrepreneurs, investors, uh, and regulators here in the same room. I think today is really a sign that um, our vision for the past two to three years is finally coming through. Uh, my name is Ronan Kirsch, and I'm the main organizer for this event and also one of the co-founders of Blockchain at Berkeley. Uh, for those who are not familiar from Blockchain at Berkeley, we're a nonprofit organization that is main mission is to push education and awareness of blockchain space. Uh, we are the first university ecosystem um, uh, and we essentially try to provide um, students as well as the community with as much knowledge as possible to get spun up in this industry uh, and contribute. We have over 250 students, active members today. We started with 10 about a year ago. Um, and our active members are involved in different uh, activities. Um, one of them is education, research and development, and consulting. So our education is doing three classes here in blockchain and in, uh, in UC Berkeley. Uh, students can come in with no knowledge and get spent up from really from a theory perspective up until hands-on development. Our research and development is working with uh, professors in UC Berkeley and other schools on cutting edge technology and research papers, um, consensus and protocol level. And our consulting is doing mainly focusing on Fortune 500 companies where we work with Airbus, Qualcomm, BMW, uh, ExxonMobil, where we educate them and then we also build proof of concepts, use cases, um, pilots, etc. Currently, we are the main initiative for blockchain in UC Berkeley. Um, there's a few other initiatives that we also help spin up, and we're looking for more of those um, around the Bay Area as well who are looking to come and join our community. So if you hear anything, we're happy to have you and talk to you. Um, our community is very open. Everything that we're doing is mainly open source. Uh, we're really trying to push this forward. So to, up until today, we incubated three companies. Um, in Blockchain at Berkeley. One of them is Code Audit and Protocol Development. Another one is ICO and Coins Due Diligence Company. And the last one is an investment fund that is launching this week. Uh, for all the entrepreneurs that are interested to uh, get help and support, um, we're more than happy to bring you in and, um, and help you with anything that we need, we, anything that uh, we can. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce uh, a good friend and a great supporter of blockchain in Berkeley, uh, Adam Sterling. He is the executive uh, director at the law school to say a few words. Thank you. Another big round of applause for Ronan and the whole blockchain at Berkeley group. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Adam Sterling. I work and teach at the law school. I'm also a proud double graduate of Berkeley. Uh, as someone that teaches, I, I often have students approach me and come up with kind of big ideas, and, and they're very excited. And I have this rule that if I say no initially, then that student wants to do that more than anything, and I'm in their way, and it's a disaster. So I've started the strategy of saying, basically, write me a proposal, and, and I'll consider it, and we'll see what we can do to support it. And not Nine times out of 10, I, I never hear anything again. Um, I want to put that in contrast to the blockchain at Berkeley group, which I think almost out of nowhere has risen to basically be the epicenter of blockchain, at least in the academic world, if, if not beyond. So much so that the Securities and Exchange Commission actually reached out to the group uh, to collaborate on an event where they can make an announcement about all that's going on. And we'll talk about that plenty today. I just want to, again, on behalf of UC Berkeley, welcome all of you. Uh, we're doing such cool things, not just the, the blockchain at Berkeley group. I'm part of a, uh, a group of three uh, instructors next semester that's teaching a class, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and the future of law, business, and technology. It's a mouthful, but we like to do that here. Uh, we will be taking 20 students from law, 20 students from business, and 20 students from engineering to collaborate on blockchain applications. So we're excited about that. Come visit. You visited today. Uh, thank you again for coming. And please, one more time, let's hear it for Blockchain at Berkeley. So now I'd like to invite uh, our first uh, panel uh, moderator, Jeremy Gardner, who is from Blockchain Capital, an entrepreneur, and done a few successful ICOs. Um, he will introduce uh, the rest of the panel. Got it. 
How's it going, everyone? Um, so the, my, the, the following list of individuals will be joining me on this panel. I've got Jason uh, Touche from Truebit. Please come, come join us. Um, Patrick Barron from Ambisafe. Uh, Amin uh, Soleimani from Spank Chain. And Vinny Lingham from Civic. I'm honored to be joined by this distinguished panel. Um, my name is Jeremy Gardner. I got into the blockchain space in seriously in about 2013. In 2014, I founded what is now known as the Blockchain Education Network, which helped spawn a blockchain at Berkeley. Through that nonprofit, I met my co-founder of what would become Augur, Joey Krug, who will be speaking with you later today. Uh, we did one of the very first ICOs, the first utility token ICO. After doing that uh, crowd sale, I went and joined Blockchain Capital, where we did the first security token ICO. So ICOs have been a big part of my life, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you my experiences. Uh, my name is Jason Teutsch. I'm uh, founder of Truebit, which is a project doing scalability for Ethereum. Uh, we're looking making smart contracts run longer, longer run times for smart contracts. So, uh, yeah, I, I, my, <clears throat> I haven't personally done an ICO before, but I did co-author a paper recently with Vitalik Buterin and Christopher Brown describing a new kind of ICO protocol, which um, we think gives more information to buyers who participate in the sales. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Patrick Barron. I'm uh, CEO of Ambisafe. We are a, a full-service ICO provider, so we help accelerate companies through the ICO process and uh, help provide guidance and introductions to folks like legal counsel and tax advisors and uh, help them to get their tokens ready uh, in terms of technology and uh, compliance. And uh, we've launched a number of ICOs on behalf of our clients. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Hi, I'm, I'm Vinny Lingham. I'm co-founder and CEO of Civic. We did a uh, token sale uh, in June of this year, raised $33 million. Um, and we're basically a digital uh, decentralized identity platform. We try to take your driver's licenses, passports, et cetera, and put it onto uh, your devices and linked up with the blockchain for ensuring that they're valid and not uh, forged or duplicated. Uh, and uh, yeah, previously I did a company called um, Gift, uh, GYFT, mobile gift card platform. It's acquired by First Data. We were one of the first companies to accept uh, cryptocurrencies and as a result of what we did in 2013, um, you, know, you could spend bitcoins at like 100,000 merchants around around the U.S. and and other parts of the world as well. So, you know, been involved in Bitcoin for quite a while, and uh, yeah, so I'm happy to chat about that as well. Hey, I'm uh, Matt Liston. Uh, I, I learned about Bitcoin in 2009 at a uh, quantum digital cash talk at Caltech, and uh, really dove in in 2012 through uh, smart contracts and autonomous agents. Uh, first big project was Augur, which I founded, and I was actually uh, Jeremy's first employer in the space. Uh, after that, I worked for Ethereum uh, and also uh, Consensus, uh, Gnosis. Uh, I ran the Gnosis uh, token sale, and I also uh, advise a handful of companies in the uh, uh, blockchain space. Hi, my name is Amin Soleimani. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Spank Chain. Uh, I got into crypto and we bought it in college for mushrooms, uh, but <clears throat> built a Bitcoin arbitrage bot, made like $5 off of Bitcoin, uh, and then like $1,000 off the price increase, and you know lost everything in Mt. Gox. Uh, joined Consensus, worked on state channels research, the ad chain project, uh, and ICO, and uh, now Spank Chain. Great, thanks gentlemen. Before going into the operations model and structures of ICOs, I think we should discuss when do you want to do an ICO? I know with Augur being maybe the fourth or fifth ICO in this space, we really didn't want to do an ICO. We did not want to have a token that we had to issue out. There was 
a lot of scary components that we were, in fact, scared of the SEC. And so we had to think long and hard about whether there was a way to create a platform that, in fact, did not need a token. But eventually, understanding how prediction markets work, we came to the conclusion that there was no way to create a, de a fully decentralized prediction market platform without creating a decentralized consensus network, which was achieved through the token that we did in, that we issued out in our ICO. As you guys have done ICOs at different stages in this industry, almost entirely later on, or just been educating yourself about them, when do you think is the proper time to conduct an ICO? And, and I'm just throwing that up in the air. Anybody, any, anybody can take it. When's a good time to raise money? I guess, that's, it's a, <laughs> uh, I guess maybe ideally you should, when you're selling a product, you should have the product ready to sell. So that's maybe the ideal time. But a lot of times when you're just starting up and you have a great white paper or whatever, you may not have. Uh, the, the the resources to, to get it together. So there's this sort of balance, I guess, you have to find between, um, you know, when you're, I mean, at a certain point, if your product needs a token, then you have to either create a token or use an existing token. So that's, right. Well, that's, so let me push back on that a bit, because if you're just raising a token, doing an ICO to raise money, Effectively, what you're suggesting is that the person's issuing out a security. If, if there's no underlying need for the token other than, the, uh, the, than to raise money, then that, I mean, that, that, that raises a real question about what, in fact, you are issuing. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I guess I, I agree. I'm, I'm being a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, tongue-in-cheek here, because obviously we're here to discuss better ways of, of running ICOs, but um, I just we have to get the elephant out of the room. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess there's, the, you, you, the, the main thing is the question is like, who do you want to have the token? How do you want, think about, I mean, the, the important questions, like how do you want to structure the token? How should, what, and all the, like it, it's totally circumstantial, right? I mean, it depends how, what you want to, to, to do with it. So yeah, I mean, security is an option, but it's certainly not the only option. I mean, some, some there are like many other reasons you might want to have a token, like, Governance, you might need it for like an intrubit for to, to pay for computations, uh, like in other words, a, a some sort of utility. Um, I mean, Augur has a token that's that's sort of sort of like that. I mean, protocol upgrades. I guess that's what we mean by by governance, and also. Um, uh, there, there, there's a range, Vinny. Why don't you tell us what led you to do conducting an ICO for Civic? Sure. So, so I'll I'll just preface that by saying, I think you should launch an ICO or token sale um, as late as possible in, in, in the life cycle of whatever you're doing, and as close as possible to it actually having utility. Um, so putting it out there early, it would put yourself in the situation where you're actually issuing a security and doing it right at the end or even after you've launched the, the network. Um, you know, if, you, if you are truly selling a utility token, you can prove it pretty quickly. Um, so. We got to the point that um, you know we wanted to to sign up partners to our network, and in order to incentivize partners to join the network, we had to create a, a network effect business model. I mean, one of the problems of solving identity is the chicken and egg problem. How do you get um, companies, governments, um, you know, people to accept the notion that a, a digital ID has the same, uh, if not better security than a, a physical ID. Um, and, and that's not something which is trivial, if you think about it. When you go to check in at a hotel or you go through an airport, um, you, they, they want to see the physical ID. And, and even though it's actually truly easier to forge a physical document than it is to uh, forge a set of cryptographic keys, um, that's just not the way the world thinks right now. So by creating a, a token economy for Civic, and when we look at what we're doing is we're building a, what we call a public utility. And so public utilities are something that I think we're going to see a lot more over the next couple of years, where um, these are utilities where the tokens are effectively owned by the public. There's no corporation backing it. So Ethereum is, would be a good example of one, and obviously Bitcoin. Um, but there are others coming up. Uh, you'd have Wi-Fi utilities where you just buy Wi-Fi coins, and you can use these coins to access Wi-Fi networks securely. Uh, VPNs, um, Orchard is a good example of, of that. Um, but I think we're moving to this public utility phase. and. The, the, the biggest issue right now is how do you navigate through 
the traditional social constructs of equity holders and companies being promised a return on investment for their investment in the company as an equity holder, and token holders, uh, on the other hand, who are being promised a return on tokens. Um, if that, that is in fact what they're investing for. And if that's the case, then it's obviously a security as well. So then you have the two classes of <laughs> shareholders. You might as well go for class A and class B shares in the company. It's kind of the same thing, except one would be liquid and tradable and the other would, would not in the current paradigm. So I would, I would probably uh, take a step back and say, look, if you're going to do a, a project, you should look at what are the governance structures and most likely, those governance structures would lead you to, to my first point, which is you should launch it at the point of it becoming utility so that the actual usage and ownership of the token is, is, um, is defined and people can understand it, and then the market would trade on that. Yeah, the, the industry is really moving in a direction where uh, the project needs to be further along than uh, six months ago, 12 months ago. So. Uh, the industry is really requiring that you have some form of functionality, uh, that you have a minimum viable product, that you have your governance in place, you have a vesting schedule in place, you're able to show a business plan, you're able to show how the money that you raise is going to be put to work, that you're able to uh, work through the legal complexities and your attorneys have given you a sign off. You know what the tax implications are going to be of what you're doing. Uh, uh, you have a fully formed team and you have interested customers. Uh, only once you have all of these is it the right time to go to market with a token sale. The, the, the issue really is the noise to signal ratio is really high right now. Yes. So if you look six months ago, uh, we were one of maybe five companies in, in June that actually went out and, and did that. Um, right now there's five happening in the past hour. Uh, online, and, and that's and I'm not even kidding. It's like I can't keep up. It's like 40 a day or something, 50 a day. So, so we're getting to the point now where it's really hard to to to, deter, to, to discriminate between people who actually are passionate about crypto and and and, and um, the technology behind it, what it can do for the world, versus me too, who can't raise funding from VCs. And that's what. So, if you look at what Vitalik and the guys did a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Ethereum is one of the great success stories, in fact, in, in the sense that it was never backed by a VC. It was backed by the community and the money was put behind it. Why did they back him and his team? Because they were deep crypto, you know, there were people who understood cryptography really well and what they were trying to build, and there was just no attention on the space. It, was, it wasn't like a no brainer. You know, people would, it wasn't obvious that they would be successful, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't as much of a you know, get rich quick sort of uh, mentality as it was to, let's see where this technology can go. So the true believers in the technology were really backing it. And they raised the money from the community who believed in the tech. Today, we have people who have no idea what's going on in crypto. They're like literally, I've got friends from South Africa where I'm from who are like, Vinny, should I buy this? I'm like, oh, do you even know what that is? And it, it's, it, this is the problem, right? So you've got the dumb money coming in. And so when dumb money comes in, it inflates prices and it also creates a, you know, a higher noise to signal ratio. So you can't tell who the, who, who the good sort of play, players and actors are. And so to the point that, um, you know, I, the, the development stage of your project becomes way more important. So Vitalik could raise the money on purely a white paper with the technical chops and expertise to build this versus today, you get five engineers in a room who know what they're doing and you won't raise the money because the, the noise is just too high. And so you have to have more proof points. It's the same as VC, right? And that's what we're getting to. Is a question up there? Or? I think that is incredibly impressive. I mean, uh, for both my sake um, and maybe the sake of the audience, could you explain what Spank Chain is and why you decided to do an ICO? Yeah, Spank Chain, <coughs> Spank Chain is exactly what you think it is. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, porn on the blockchain. Uh, it's a economic platform for the adult entertainment industry, uh, so that. Um, they can build payment systems for uh, tipping, for live streaming, for ad networks, affiliate systems uh, in, uh, on top of the Spank Chain platform. Um, so we, we decided to do an ICO because uh, it's a good way to engage the community, uh, to have a distributed network of stakeholders uh, who are helping to create value um, together. and. Having that earlier in the project's lifetime uh, helps. Uh, so we we are you know past. We're, it's not totally live, but 
Um, we have a payment channels tech demo and a lot of uh, registered models who want to participate. And I thought that the project was at a good point in its lifetime to do an ICO. Great, thank you. All right, well, let's get into the nitty gritty here uh, and, and start with kind of the early life cycle of an ICO and talk about pre-sales. Back in the day when, when, when I did my first ICO, pre-sales were not really an option. I tried explaining what a utility token or application token, as we called it back in the day, was to all the main investors in the industry. And nobody really got what we were building with Augur, and we couldn't actually sell pre-sale tokens. And then about a month before the ICO, we ran out of money, and we were able to convince a few people uh, to, to do a pre-sale. But today, the atmosphere is a lot different. Uh, today, pre-sales often make up the majority of the sales going into an ICO. Uh, and I think, Vinny, you, you guys had a very interesting model for that. Why, why don't you explain what you did? So we, we OK, again, <laughs> the, the signal to noise ratio was actually pretty good back then because of a few companies doing it. So people knew what we were doing. We did zero PR marketing. I mean, we, we, when I said zero PR, we actually we obviously did a couple of interviews. But we, we spent no money on, on marketing, buying ads, et cetera. It was all word of mouth, um, people following me on Twitter, et cetera. And we literally sold out everything in the pre-sale. So we had it fully subscribed. There were no discounts. So no one got any anyone who bought tokens from Civic in the in the pre-sale or the or the, the the crowd sale paid the same price. No insiders didn't get a discount. Uh, we kept every single person. Um, the most anyone could buy was 500k, and then we, because of the oversubscription, it would, they were stuck at three point uh, so three hundred thirty three thousand uh, dollars in in the token sale. So it was very widely distributed. We had over but I'd say over hundred million dollars worth of demand for it. Um, but again, no discounts. Um, so what that did really what it did for us is show that we we didn't want to give preference to anyone. We thought we felt it was a pretty open market, and at the time, most token sales would have a hundred or two hundred buyers, and those buyers um, would have a high concentration. So I think the one token sale had twenty five percent sitting with one buyer. Um, there's no one in our token sale that got more than one percent of what was sold, um, and so uh, you know. The distribution curve was really good. We had about 10,000 people participating, um, 50,000 people in the queue. And again, this was only possible at a time where there was just a very uh, few, there weren't as many companies trying to do this. So when, when a quality company came up, people could recognize it pretty easily. There wasn't noise dragging them down, and they weren't looking at 50 other deals. But right now, the problem right now really is that you know, the number of deals and uh, I get in my inbox, even if there's a great one in there, I'm going to go through all the others to figure out that that's a great one versus, you know, back in June, they'd be like, you know, uh, one or two a week or whatever it is. And you could actually dig in, dive deep in, and not miss something. But now you're just missing the good ones because of the, the high noise ratio. Patrick, so how does, I'll oh, go, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so I'd, I'd agree with Vinny. Uh, generally, the, the projects that need to do pre-sales are the ones that are going to have problems uh, filling their actual token sale. Um, Gnosis actually didn't have any pre-sale, uh, and you know it's it's basically if you have a good project, you don't need to market, you don't need to have pre-sales. Um, there's there's sort of like two current trends in pre-sales. Um, one is public pre-sales, where you either you know you say if you participate uh, X amount or higher, uh, then you get Y discount, and this usually happens uh, like a week before uh, or even closer to the actual sale. Um, this is really unhealthy for the ecosystem. Um, we shouldn't be giving advantages to larger, uh, you know, larger uh, crypto holders. Um, then the other trend is uh, private pre-sales, um, and you know, it, it used to be this would mean uh, you raise, uh, you know, something like 500k to 700k uh, from you know, sort of like angel participants. And what this does is it gets you three to six months um, to the actual token sale. And uh, you know, it, it used to be that they would get essentially a, a, a discount on the eventual sale uh, as a percentage. Um, now that's moving to something that's uh, really unhealthy. It's uh, uh, basically VCs are bringing the uh, Silicon Valley Ponzi scheme to tokens. Uh, so uh, what, what these projects do is uh, basically you know, maybe six months before their sale, uh, they go to big name VCs and investors and they say, hey, we're going to give you tokens at a 1,000% discount. 
or we're going to give you shares in a company that bear dividends. Um, they're going to have an advantage over the tokens, and you're going to get like filthy rich in a period of six months. Um, they do this so that they can get a small round with those VCs, and then they can do uh, a public-private sale, and then a public sale, which are astronomical because people see these big names involved. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm sort of pissed off at the investor community, particularly these large names in Silicon Valley, who you know I won't name VC funds, but they're fairly respectable. And they're sort of taking advantage of the space, and it's well, really disgusting. Let, let, let me this push back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, yeah, go yeah. for it. Just, I'll throw one in the head. You can throw one in the head. We'll go. <laughs> I mean, well, I'd like to push back on that because the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of these new token models and, and these new startups creating platforms, such as Augur, actually do not have a model which allows you to sell equity in a company. Often there's an open source software foundation behind these new token economies that are being created. And thus, without the ability to uh, s sell equity in an organization before you're ready for your ICO, it's very hard to bootstrap a startup. And so we've seen the introduction of something called a SAFT, which only allows accredited investors to participate in these pre-sales. I don't think this is unethical or even a bad thing. I think VCs are able to take larger amounts of risk than your average consumer and much earlier on than, than your average consumer should. A consumer should not be investing in white papers, but whereas VCs can afford to do that, and those SAFT agreements, which are just like a safe agreement in a normal equity, a lot, represents a pretty much a discount on a future ICO. But this is a way for startups to stay compliant in a regulatory scheme and really reduces the risk that consumers get bamboozled. So I, I, I challenge that. I mean, Matt, yeah, I, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, Matt you yeah, came out of consensus. You came out of a, a, a large kind of corporation. So it, it's a lot different for a, a, a bootstrap team of like, like five college dropouts that don't have a penny to their name to go start a company. Yeah, Jeremy, I disagree on both counts. I mean, first of all, you, these companies are not just giving equity and then also doing tokens. They're also doing literally like 1,000% discounts on tokens. Well, um, and they're doing it. They could get, you know, they could just sell a 40% discount and get it from angels in the space. There's plenty of crypto money floating around that can assume the risk, but they're doing it so that they can get big names and that's it, so that they can do, you know, token sales on billion dollar plus market caps. That's just disgusting. Didn't you the do second that? thing, not at all. Not at all, Jeremy. Sec second of all, the SAFT is actually incredibly contradictory and I think it's a huge risk for the space. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see some SEC clarity on this, but basically what you're saying is we're gonna sell a security and then we're gonna sell, sell a commodity. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that the SAFT is actually a great thing. I think we need to restructure how we do these, like, early sales. I, I, would, I, would, I would agree with a lot of that, but let me add one thing. I would be okay with VCs doing this if they were, would agree to similar lock-ins. Even, even, I'd even be happy with, like, a half the lock-in that they, tr that they normally have with traditional equities. Mm -hmm. But these VCs are buying in and they're dumping in the market months later. Mm -hmm. I won't name names. But, uh, sure. <laughs> but literally... Um, this is the problem. So they get in, they use the, what happens is they buy in, they, they use their names to pump the price of the token up, okay? There's a huge lot of, the, the, the governance issues around this stuff is like mind blowing for me, okay? And then they're able to quietly dump it either through secondary sales or whatever else. They should be locked in mm -hmm. to, you know, if, think about it this way, okay? If you're buying in because a big name VC who traditionally stays with a company seven or 10 years is in on, is in on, on a deal, and then all of a sudden they dump it. You're the bag holder, minus 50, minus 80 uh, percent on the token that's now being traded. And they got out. They made a profit on their name. And it's like you know, the deniability. Like ah, we thought the market was over here. We got out. Whatever. Like they should be locked in. Anyone 100%. getting discount. And th this is the, the decision point we got to at Civic. When we looked at doing any discounts, because we considered it, we thought, okay, well, what happens if we're not fully subscribed? You know, what are the scenarios? How, how do we deal with this? The one thing we were very clear on, if we did offer a discount, it would come with significant lockups for people. And in the end, we didn't do it. But that was, when I look at token sales today and there are no lockups for people who are getting big discounts, I won't touch them because the incentives, so think about it this way. So it's, it, it, trading behavior, Civic never traded below its issue price ever through whatever ups and downs, it's always been up. So if you bought from Civic, I think it was 10 cents, we issued that, it's never traded below that. Because there's no incentive for anyone to ever sell below that, right? But even if it dropped to 10 cents, if you gave someone a 50% discount, he's making a profit. So it really screws up the, the, the free market, in my opinion. 
Yeah. yeah. The problem, the other problem with this is the lack of disclosure. Yeah. The lack of disclosure of whether or not there's a lockup period yeah. and what the intention is. Uh, and, and the industry is starting to require that. And, uh, you know, the other problem that I see is that there's too much focus on the price of tokens and yeah. where they go. I mean, this is not about, uh, at least for me, this is not about uh, buying a token and having it go up. This is about building sustainable businesses, building businesses that change the world, building businesses that create new economies that didn't exist before, that give new opportunities that didn't exist before. And so the focus on these short-term profits, I, I is not the spirit of what this was created for. And uh, we hopefully will all be able to come together and uh, in a self-regulatory way to prevent this type of bad behavior that we all agree is not good for the ecosystem. Is it really about? Sorry. Uh, I, I, you guys, I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk about this for the rest of this panel, but we've only got 20 minutes and we've got a lot more to cover, so we're going to move on. But this, this is an important thing for us to address as an industry, absolutely. Let's talk about distribution. How much should go to founders? How much should go, I mean, we, we, we've talked, spoken about the pre-sale. How much should go to the market at the end of the ICO? Uh, how much should go to a foundation if there is one? Uh, th this has been something that's been hotly contested as well. Yeah, so one, one thing I'd like to focus on is secondary distribution mechanisms. Um, you know, we, we have tokens and we're focused on this, this token sale craze because people can, you know, by them, um, but it's, it's actually more interesting when you use tokens to actually align incentives in the networks. And you can do this by having mechanisms where like, you know, if it's a content network, you can earn tokens by actually, you know, providing content to the network. Or, you know, maybe you distribute tokens to people wanting to build interesting things on your platform. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, I think, a really, really important distribution mechanism. And I think, um, you know, also, especially with the current amount of crypto wealth, I'd like to see projects that actually don't do token sales and that just have secondary distribution mechanisms because that's, I mean, that's, you know, as you were saying, that's kind of the spirit of what these tokens are supposed to do. It's supposed to provide a value add to a network that couldn't be there before. Like Matt, aren't 95% of Gnosis tokens held by the founders? Um, no, that's not true at all. H how much? 10%. Uh, so, and so, actually so, so, not so, because so, they're, they're on a release schedule. So 90% was distributed in the ICO? No, 5% uh, was distributed in the ICO. Okay, so how does that work for the market? Right, so uh, there was an auction. Uh, the auction ended quickly. It was a, a, mech, a type of Dutch auction, and it ended at a point where 5% was sold. 86% um, is then held for secondary distribution mechanisms, like I'm saying. Uh, it's, uh, it's unlikely that those are, are distributed in the next three years, maybe even beyond, um, and it can be used to support uh, people building interesting things in our platform. All right, I think it's also important to point out that the the purpose of being able to trade a token is not to make money. That is not the ultimate uh, reason for being for this mechanism. The reason why this exists is because the only way to interact peer to peer is to be able to buy and sell. And so it's not so much that there's this need to create new Wall Street assets that can make some people rich and some people not rich. It's because the only way to facilitate these new economies and these new types of businesses is to have an ability to trade. The speculation and the trading aspect and the discounts, this is all just uh, a, a negative externality of the fact that this type of trade needs to be able to be facilitated in order for these visions to be realized. I'll, I'll totally push back on that. I mean, I don't believe blockchain networks work unless you have financial incentives. I mean, I mean, money and, and, and financial gain is, is the main driver of these crypto economies. And so I don't think it's a negative externality. I mean, it, it, it is the primary catalyst for what makes these networks work. Uh, Jeremy, um, you know, so, something like I think all projects are dealing with, including Augur, is scalability and infrastructure. Um, you know, infrastructure is the most critical piece of these blockchains right now. It's not there. We can't scale and have efficient networks yet. Um, yeah. These things largely need to be public goods. Um, you know, we need to find ways to incentivize people beyond just like, oh my gosh, you can do a token sale and magically get rich. Um, so, no, I don't think that's accurate. And I think. That's what's wrong with the space right now. There's people coming in thinking this is a way to make wealth. And no, this is actually a way to make really interesting new types of economies. 
my, my, my greater point here is, is that a, a, a crypto token does not work unless there are properly aligned incentives in the network being created. The great thing about blockchains is that they create network effects. But if you don't create a network in which people are properly incentivized to behave in, the, in a rational manner and in a way that makes the network work, it doesn't. And, and, and one of these things that I see in this space, yes, I see a lot of greed. It's problematic. I see people coming in just trying to raise a bunch of money. I hate that. But at the same time, you have to develop crypto economic models that incentivize all the actors in the system to behave in a rational manner that yes. makes the system work. Agreed. And we, you can't forget that. Agreed. Your point point taken, and uh, and and that is absolutely correct. And and let me clarify: the the purpose of these token sales is not to help early purchasers make Correct. a lot of money. And it's not about the speculators. Yes, absolutely, there has to be crypto economics that makes sense, that incentivize a consensus mechanism to work in these types of things. Uh, but that is a means to the end. The end is actually facilitating some sort of exchange of value, some sort of service, these types of things. That's the point I'd like to make. Yeah, so Jeremy, I would, I would also argue that tokens that are earned align incentives much more than tokens that are bought. Uh, that's what I'm talking about with secondary distribution, distribution mechanisms, whether it be an inflationary model to reward proof of stake, um, or like I was saying, something that rewards content creators. So you don't need to sell tokens as the primary way to align incentives. It's actually not a very good way to align incentives because you largely get in VCs, token funds, you know, people who want to speculate on the tokens. I, I think, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of VC bashing here, and I, wa I want to go on to operations <laughs> next. But I, and you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm very biased here. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you're an entrepreneur building a business for the first time, it's really hard. And having a thousand people around the world that believe in your idea and want it to succeed, that's great. But having experienced executives that actually know how to go build a company, that often have IPO'd a company, that have been through the process of entrepreneurship before, is really helpful. And so I, I, I think if any of you guys are out here thinking about doing an ICO, there is, a, there is a significant benefit to having VCs that have helped structure companies before, helped scale companies before. Even, even if it's a guy like me, I'm only 25, but I've done a couple of ICOs before. If you're an entrepreneur, I can help you think through this process. And that's something that the average ICO participant just simply cannot do. But, but, but let, let, let's move forward with operations. Just, just one second. Can you name, you know, five VCs and what their value add is, you know, beyond actually funding the companies and throwing their name on it? 100%. I mean, whether it's, it's Pantera, DCG, Blockchain Capital, Polychain, Metastable, all these guys have deep roots in this industry. They can help to connect teams to whether it's media, whether it's uh, developers, whether it's other teams that are working on similar projects, helping them understand the different blockchains in the ecosystem. If you're coming into this space for the first time, there's a lot of information information you need to process and working with folks that have been in this space for a while and are comfortable with it can really help advance your cause much faster and help you from tripping up. Yes, yeah, so largely, I mean, I've, I've seen them be gatekeepers to token sales, whether by reputation or by like connections to lawyers and figuring out how to structure them. I've seen those same VC funds then dump their tokens on the market and ditch the companies. I'm talking so, about so like providing long-term value. these are two different value. issues. What you're talking about is the ethical behavior of venture capitalists versus the value <laughs> add of the VCs. I, I didn't know ethical take, was I'll, like. I'll take ethical behavior over value add any day. Uh, that, that, that's just that's just the, that's just me. Um, look, it, you know, to some extent, obviously, the, the the VCs have been in the crypto space for a while. Pantera, blockchain capital, etc. They'll add you know infinitely more value than a VC a year ago who couldn't tell you what a blockchain was. Okay, and, and that's, that's and the problem is right now, we've got centralization of VCs. There's a very few number of VCs that can actually help in, the, in this world. The second point, Jeremy, I would, I would argue is, look, when we look at Civic, I tell people we're not building a company, we're building a public utility. We will become a nonprofit at some point. It doesn't make sense for us to do it right now. We did not set up an offshore structure in Cayman Islands to, to avoid taxes. We're paying taxes on our token sale as income. We've, like, we've, we've thought through all the ins and outs of this. We're not building a company, we're building a public utility. 
so if you want to get advice from someone who's done this before, let me know because I don't know anyone else who's done this except Vitalik and a few others, okay? The, the VCs can't help. They think about this in terms of shareholder value and creating companies. We're building protocols. We're building a, a new, like, kind of substrate for the, for the world, right? How do we look at the world differently? And so I would contest that VCs today have the tools, knowledge, and experience. They may have parallels, but they haven't done this before. It's something very different. And the way you engage communities, the way you do second, secondary distribution of tokens, we kept a third of our tokens for partners to give away to partners to use the, the ecosystem and, and engage with us to build the, the network effects. Um, so when we look at to, you know, token distribution to founders, I mean, I'll give an example. We, in our company, we kept one third of the tokens back. Now that, you know, we're VC back, so call it, you know, 30, 40% of our cap table goes to VCs, and we can sell some at 33% in the future to fund the company if we need to, to the point where it's self-sustaining. So in the end, founders typically in these projects, 10 to 20% is kind of the norm and is acceptable. When founders are sitting above, you know, 30, 40% after token sale, I'll get very concerned because it, it, this is not, you know, so one point that came up at a panel, I think it was I was on Jer with Jeremy uh, a day or two ago, was um, uh, dilution, right? People say, well, you can do a token sale and not dilute your equity. Well, I'm like, hang on a second. <laughs> so you're doing a token sale, you're promising value to the token holders, and you're telling your shareholders you're not diluting the equity. Uh, uh, like, you have to create a value trap, okay? Where does the value accrue to? Does it accrue to the token holders and the network, or does it accrue to the shareholders? And this conflict is what's going to break this uh, this industry when it comes to regulations and and when you go up in front of a judge and say, well, I mean, I, I have to give a good example. We, we've had companies come to us and offer us, call it the half a million dollars to do a pilot with them, but that would take our engineers off the protocol development and what we're trying to build, but it would make profit for the company. And that's a dilemma, right? So for an inexperienced entrepreneur, you'd be like, well, I can get 500,000 bucks in, I can pay extra bonuses, people are happy, but the token holders can wait. Yeah, it's fine. No, they can't. You can't have a situation where you, you have a misalignment of interest here. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem we're faced with right now from a governance perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, back to my point, I'll take ethics over anything, any, any day, because if you, if, you, if, you stray, if you stray from that line, you will wind up failing, I believe, in this space, because there are no rules and there are, there's no experience. So you need a sense, set of principles and morals to get you there, because we're, 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 we're pioneers. We're forging the path forward. We don't know where this is going to wind up, but if you put profit ab above um, what you're promising to people, what you're trying to do, I think you'll fail. I, I, uh, I'd like to move forward, if, if, if we can. Just we, 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 we have a lot more to cover. We won't get to it all. I mean, I, I, I think Finney is entirely right here. And I mean, the beautiful thing about ICOs and these token economies, when done correctly, is they create a totally new realignment of interest, where everyone from the founders to the investors to the, 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 the employees and even, even the users of the products all have the same interest and it's to see this token and, and this economy succeed. But because we're talking about structuring an ICO, let's talk about the operations here. How do you go out and communicate an ICO to the market, especially when the signal to noise ratio is just totally messed up? Yeah. So, um you know, you, you don't spend on marketing, and if you do spend on marketing, you don't make videos like Karma. Um, what you do is you build, <laughs> you, you, build uh, you know, valuable technical products, and you go communicate how they work, and you engage with the community, and if you do that right, then you don't need any marketing. V Vinny, how did, how did you initially communicate this, uh, the Civic ICO? Well, I mean, we, we announced it at the consensus conference, uh, which is an industry conference. So we had a, a ton of people in the industry understood what we're trying to do, how we're trying to fix the problem, et cetera. Um, you know, just Twitter interviews, et cetera. And obviously, I, I've, got a, you know, I've got a good brand, I hope, in the industry from my previous company. So people willing to, to listen to what I have to say. And, and you know, uh, look, the, the other thing is, in, in the VC world, is, is there's a lot of signals. So who's investing? It's a bit of a lemming, lemmings uh, um, uh, situation. And, we try to avoid a lot of that, so we didn't tell people who else was investing in in, in, in Civic. But they get, you know, they, they knew people to tell their friends I'm investing. Big name guys came in, and, and we had a whole bunch of people trying to pile into it. Um, it has changed right now, so I'm, I'm, I think the marketing stuff. I, I, I look here's the here's the issue. If you're trying to take too much value off the table, like we could have priced our ICO 
I think three times higher than what we did, and we would probably sold 100 million bucks anyway. Uh, but we didn't. We, we were very disciplined about how we did it. And based upon the stage we were at, et cetera, um, you know, I'm an investor in, in, in Filecoin and a couple others that have raised large amounts of money. And, you know, good. I'm glad they're able to do it, obviously, as an investor. But I still think that there's, there's um, some questions around what stage you're at and how much you raise is, is something for consideration. So this is the how I would I would... Think about it. If you have a white paper and you're going to start a token sale right now, you're probably not going to get the funding you want. You might get some guys to put in 500k or a million bucks. You're better off going to a couple of angels who want to back it early, give them a, a SAFT or some equity or something along those lines. But if you if you can push this out as far as possible so you have a, a really good product, a working product, just be conscious of how much you are raising. You can always sell more tokens later on. You can always, you know, it's, it's don't take more money than you need. Okay, and, and this is a funny thing, which people have like said to me, oh, we'll just do another token sale. I'm like, oh, hold a second, you've got to fix supply. You, you, you don't really, you can't do another token sale. You can maybe sell in the secondary market, but you can't, you can't ICO twice. Um, so be very ca careful of how you do that. I, the, the, the marketing side is, again, you know, to the point that if you're building something great, people will put money behind it. It's true, but if people put too much behind it, the weight of how much they're putting in is going gonna, is gonna to be a problem. This, this is also an area where the industry really needs to pay attention to the regulations that exist. Uh, because if the token that is being sold is a security, there's very clear things that you cannot do. And there's very clear things that are being done that should not be done. Uh, you know, I, I would point to Floyd Merriweather as a, as a prime <laughs> example. Hey, don't use celebrities to endorse your ICOs. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's not okay, and that's not good for this ecosystem. And so when it comes to PR and marketing, it's very important that you have a legal counsel that is making a determination of whether or not this is okay or this is not okay. It's not a go it alone, because there are consequences for not following the rules that do exist. And the power of the state is very strong. It is, it is overwhelming, and you can't ignore it. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the United States is not the only jurisdiction in the world. There's securities laws and there's jurisdictions all around the world that if you're selling into, you should probably have uh, advice and advisors locally that understand the rules of the road there. So, you know, this is a very important topic, and I'm glad you asked that question. Let's talk about jurisdictions. Uh, a, a lot of ICOs are just choosing to avoid the United States, geofencing, doing the, the, w whatever within their ability to not allow American cu customers to participate in their ICOs. Do you guys see this as a viable strategy? I, I think that that's probably a, a great question for the last panel. Uh, I would, you know, I, I think that uh, that's not what, uh, you know, that's not a good thing if that's the strategy, right? It's, uh, you, there should, the industry needs to uh, find ways to do this and do it correctly and uh, do it in compliance. And again, the United States is not the only jurisdiction that has regulators. And so you can avoid the United States and perhaps uh, avoid the ire of uh, misbehavior, perhaps not. If you live here, you know, you still, you live here, right? You, you still have to follow these rules. And the EU has securities regulations and you know Brazil has securities regulations and Australia does and all of these other places so you know I, I think that figuring out the way to do it correctly here and do it correctly in the areas where you are going to be selling the token is the is the approach the industry needs to take yeah, I, I just want to say I'm, I'm really excited to hear what uh, the guys at the SEC have to say later uh, because I mean we we want to do this correctly uh, there is currently not enough clarity uh, so, yeah, yeah. To fingers crossed that we, we, we get a better sense of how to do this right uh, moving forward because, the, because right now we're just kind of shooting blanks, guessing. Yeah. Um, well, look, I mean, I think this, this, is, this is moving quickly, not just for us, but also for the regulators that are, you know, one, uh, attempting to understand the technology. I was thinking on my way over here of how complex this technology is and how I learn on a daily basis something new about the technology. And I try to put myself in the position of a, 
policymakers and uh, regulators that uh, you know have a hundred other responsibilities, and so there, you know, the the ability to understand a very quickly evolving technology is not an e easy task, even when you're in it on a daily basis. And you know, I think that there uh, there is goodwill on both sides, and both sides recognize that the the dialogue uh, should continue so that we can get very clear paths that one protect consumers, uh, two facilitate entrepreneurship, and I think that those those goals are aligned with with everybody. So, you know, there's uh, there's definitely good actors out there, and the bad actors that are out there, the industry needs to work together to make it very difficult for them to succeed. It's become clear that this should have been a two-hour panel because we have a lot more to cover, um, and we have about two minutes left. Uh, so unfortunately, we're going to miss a lot, but why don't we take maybe one or two questions from the audience, assuming there are some, and, uh, and, and that way we can get you guys a bit more engaged here. So one thing we wanted to ask around the incentivizing to grow the ecosystem. So why not do network tokens rather than fixed amount of tokens so that people can mine them and earn them over time? That way they have the incentive to host your servers, really truly decentralize the ecosystem rather than someone holding the, all the tokens and then giving them over time. Well, I, I, I think that question can be answered just based on the, the, what you're building. If you're building a new protocol, uh, a new blockchain like Ethereum or Filecoin, yes, you're going to you're going to create a, a, a mining network. Uh, but if you're creating an application like Augur, there, that's not how the network works. You you have no need for mining. That's not that, that's not the point of the token. The token is to create consensus, not not to validate transactions. And, and but if you have to do something like storage or something like that, then you need a lot of nodes. Correct. And in that scenario, you need to build either a slightly different which consensus. Is, which is why a Filecoin, which is a protocol token, actually has a, a, a mining, well, well proof of, uh, so of storage. You don't yeah. actually need an inflationary model to do this, though. Um, you can do an ERC-20 with a finite supply, and you can use a smart contract that defines release uh, via participation in the network. So you, you can achieve both goals. Oh, you can. OK, yeah, thanks. The hard, the hard part there is just having it uh, so that it's algorithmically distributed, uh, or you have to replace the machine proof of work with some sort of like human judged proof of work system, and that's tricky. Got it. Thanks. W one more question. Uh, we've got a lot, so I'm not going to choose. Or I, I will. Way in back, the guy with the beard. Yeah. What do you think is the most challenging thing about doing an ICO right now? Um, it's cool. So the Spank Chain ICO was like the most important thing that happened in the ecosystem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but everybody was distracted by the Bitcoin civil war. Um, and and that, was, that was a little bit hard. Um, and another, another thing that's like just generally hard uh, was the, the content, right? So we have a lot of people who support us quietly. Uh, <laughs> For very obvious reasons, <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I had reputational risk uh, by being an advisor several times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that was probably hard. It, it, we you know we, we get followers on on Twitter, but like we'll, we won't get a lot of retweets for stuff. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it helps that you have porn stars <laughs> tweeting on your behalf. Uh, well, yeah, they're they're you know we have uh, everybody. The majority of people watch porn. Uh, so having the porn stars spread the message, I think, is a way of achieving organic growth. That's what you want. And that's also, I mean, that's also the really exciting part. Because you know, right now, we have, like, I don't know, 95% male engineers. And we're also not very good at communicating what these technologies can do you know, outside of how they align incentives within blockchains. So you know, it's, it's really exciting for me to see new people coming in who will like understand this from a different perspective and also have it solve a pain point in their industry. All right, well on that note, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, this was great.